Well, Operation Blessing is a Christian humanitarian organization, and they work around the world. They do many wonderful humanitarian things, and as you saw, one of the important humanitarian things they do is organize eye care mission trips. Uh, they travel to a third world country, they provide glasses, medicine, surgical procedures just to help people see better. Maybe you know this, but vision impairment is an epidemic around the world. According to Lighthouse International, an organization which measures these types of things, over 285 million people in the world are visually impaired. 39 million of them are blind entirely, and 246 million of them have moderate to severe vision loss. Now, this is obviously terrible, given the specific consequences of not being able to see. Vision-impaired children have a hard time learning in school, and vision-impaired adults have a hard time finding work, meaning that it's just that harder to crest the poverty line. And what's perhaps worst of all is that according to Lighthouse International, 85% of all visually, visual impairment could be prevented or cured with basic treatment. 85% of all the world's visually impaired people uh, could get their sight back with the proper treatment. Millions of blind people can see worldwide with simple surgeries, treatments, medicines, and eye care. It's just not available in most parts of the world. This is why organizations like Operation Blessing do some very important work, just helping people see. One of Rooftop's own eye care, Christian eye care professionals, Danielle Sedio, she's not here this morning, but she told me of several Christian eye care organizations that do similar, similar things. The Fellowship of Christian Optometrists organizes eye care mission trips around the world. Also, the Christian Ophthalmology Society organizes mission trips and inspires Christians to pursue a career in ophthalmology. All these organizations do great work, but their work is great not just because they help people see. Yes, God gave us eyes. We should be able to use them. That's why we have them. But the work these organizations do is important for a deeper reason. As these organizations understand, it's much easier for people to see God if they can actually see. It's much easier for people to see Jesus if they can actually use their eyes. That's why God gave us eyes in the first place, so that we could see him. This is the theme of the story from the Gospel of John that we're going to study together this morning. We're studying the Gospel of John here at Rooftop right now in a series called Street Fighter. We've broken John up into certain sections, and in this section of John, we see Jesus out in public doing his Messiah thing on the street, ra raising a ruckus. This morning we're going to start looking at a long story in John chapter 9 in which Jesus heals a blind man, much to the amazement and consternation of the people who find out. As we'll see this morning, the story is rich in detail and importance, which is why we've broken it up into several weeks. And this morning I want to look at the initial miracle and then just go from there over the course of the next couple of weeks. I'm going to be reading the story to you from John chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. You can follow along in your program, the story's printed there or from the screens above, or in your Bibles if you brought them. John 9, 1. As Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? <sighs> Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it in the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, this word means sent, so the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, No, I am the man. How then were your eyes open? They asked. He replied, Well, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it in my eyes told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. Goes on a little bit. We'll get to that next week. 
This is an important story. Now, I know I just read it to you, but on the off chance that you were dozing or you didn't get the gist of it, let me just go ahead and summarize it for you again. In the story, Jesus is walking along, happens upon a man blind from birth. Jesus' disciples start up a theological conversation about why this man was born blind. Was it because of his sin or his parents? Now, in Jesus' day, people thought that illness and suffering were the result of sin in your life. If you got a cold, it must be because you cussed. The disciples are confused, though, because this man was blind from birth. How did he sin to become blind unless he cussed in the womb? Who knows? So they wonder if maybe his parents sinned instead of him. Either way, Jesus rejects the premise of their question. He explains to them that neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life, at which point he spits down in the dirt, makes a mud paste, slaps it on the guy's eyes. Thankfully, the guy was blind, so he didn't see this happening because that would have been really gross. Then he tells the man to make his way to the pool called Scent, which is kind of funny to give directions to a guy, a blind guy with mud in his eyes, and go wash off the mud. The man does this and comes out seeing. The man's friends catch up with him, and they're confused. He looks like their blind beggar friend, but obviously he isn't because this man can see. But he insists, no, I am the man. They ask how this is possible, and he tells them, well, there was this guy named Jesus. He loogied in the dirt and gave me a mud pack and told me to wash, and now I can see how ugly all my friends are. Like I said, story goes on a bit as people struggle to know how to react. As we'll find out in the next couple of weeks, not everybody, oddly, is excited to hear or see it. But this is the miracle itself. It is an interesting miracle with the mud and the spit and everything. As a bit of trivia, it's not the only time Jesus heals someone with spit. It happens several times, in fact. Scholars have a hard time explaining the spit thing. Why did Jesus have to use spit? This is gross, what Jesus does. Back in the ancient world, some people believed that spit had therapeutic value. If your child gets a boo-boo on the playground today, what do you do? You kiss it, which is kind of gross if you think about it. And back then, instead of kissing boo-boos, they would spit in it. It's gross either way, but even if spit did have therapeutic value, why would Jesus need spit? Why couldn't he just say, hey, now you can see? No spit. To be entirely honest, we have no idea why Jesus does this. No idea at all. It'd be easy, it'd be interesting to be able to see inside Jesus' mind, but we have no idea. The story has great meaning aside from the issue of spittle, though. In fact, this story was a very important story in the history of the church and is very important to our service this morning. You see, in the first few centuries of the church, after Jesus had ascended to heaven, uh, the first Christians told this story a lot on or around Baptism Sunday. Back in the early days of Christianity, the church usually did baptisms near Easter. And before their baptisms, the story of the healing of the blind man would get told as a baptismal story. Might not appear to be a story about baptism, but it's got a lot of baptismal elements. Jesus puts mud on this guy's face, tells him to go wash. Only after being cleansed is he healed. And the early church understood this story is an illustration of what happens when we are baptized. We are cleansed of the guilt, the dirt of our sin, and our spirits and our bodies are healed forever in heaven. After this story was told on Baptism Sunday, new converts would be asked what this man is asked by Jesus later in the story. In the part I haven't read yet, in verse 35, Jesus catches up with the guy and he asks him, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And the new converts would respond the way the man did in verse 38, Lord, I believe. So there's a lot of liturgical value to the story. By liturgical value, I mean it was important in the worship of the early church. They used this story to instruct new Christians. Still today, the story has much to teach new converts, but it also has much to teach all of us. There is a definite point to this story for all people. And I'm going to go ahead and phrase and summarize the point like this. Jesus heals to reveal he is real. Jesus heals to reveal he is real. Usually I don't like catchy rhyming phrases, 
I'm more of a three-point alliteration guy. Those are my poetic devices of choice. But I'm trying to stretch out, I'm trying to try some rhyming here. And that's the point of the story. Jesus heals to reveal he is real. And with the rest of my time, I want to go back through the story and find out where that comes from and what it means for us, starting with the first phrase, the first part. Jesus heals. This is obviously a healing story. Jesus gives sight to a man blind from birth. It's a reminder that this is what Jesus came to earth to do. He came to heal. When he appeared, when he first appeared on the stage, he made this announcement that this is what he came to do in his first sermon ever. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind. And that's what he does here. Among other things, he actually helps people, blind people see. He doesn't just help them see spiritually. He actually makes them see. He gives them sight. But he does many miracles. He heals many diseases. Matthew writes, another writer writes, that all who touched Jesus were healed. And Luke records that people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sicknesses, and laying his hands on each one of them, he healed them. Jesus came to heal. He came to heal us physically. He came to heal our society of its ills. He came to heal our broken churches, our broken relationships. He came to heal our inner wounds. He came to heal. And he also came to enlist us in this healing effort. Even here in John, he tells his disciples that as long as it is day, we must do the work of the one who sent us. Who must do the work of the one who sent us? We must. And when he sends his disciples out into the world in the Gospel of Matthew, he tells them, as you go, preach this message, the kingdom of heaven is near, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. That's not just his work, that's our work. He tells us to go into the world, to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, drive out demons. Now I know the topic of healing is not simple. I've never raised any from anybody from the dead. I wouldn't know where to start. Plenty of us want to believe that Jesus has the power to heal by prayer and the Spirit, but as much as we believe God wants to heal, he can seem strangely, frustratingly reluctant. I'm not going to pretend I have all the answers here. I'm speaking on faith. I'm also speaking as one who really needs God's healing power for his family. It's very easy to doubt that Jesus has the power and the will to heal. But an even bigger problem, I think, than our doubt is our judgment. Let me say that again. An even bigger problem than our doubt is our judgment. And we see that here in this story. If you notice, Jesus and his disciples are walking by a blind man, and what is the disciples' first reaction? They judge him. Who is the sinner here? This man or his parents? Like I said, back then people believed that suffering and sickness were the result of sin. Sometimes that's true, but not always, and it's usually not worth bringing up when there's a need to meet in front of you. And while their reaction was to debate him, to judge him, to wonder how much of a sinner he was, Jesus' first reaction was to help him. This man doesn't need our analysis, he doesn't need our judgment, he needs our help. This happens so that the work of God may be displayed in his life. Jesus came to heal, not to judge. One of the main reasons we probably see so little healing in the church today is because we can be so darn judgmental. We see someone hurting, and we look for blame instead of offering help. In the 1980s, for example, as AIDS was spreading through the homosexual community, Christians held back, suspecting it was God's judgment for sin and that we needed to let it play out. Millions of Christians thought these people are only getting what they deserve. But we all do this. Instead of helping homeless people on the street, we wonder what mistakes they made to wind up there. Instead of helping single moms who are in over their head, we shake our own heads in judgment at how they shouldn't have gotten pregnant or shouldn't have dropped out of school. They made their bed. Right now, our own family, my own family, is serving a family member who made plenty of mistakes in life, which he is suffering for. It's not our business to judge him for his choices. Our business is to help him, praying for his healing, showing him God's grace. 
Jesus came to heal. We came to judge and to analyze. Jesus came to help and save. Why do we think our agenda should be any different? Who's someone in your life right now that you know you've judged instead of helped? Who's someone in your life you know, right now that you know you've judged instead of helped? A family member, a neighbor, a coworker. Jesus heals. That's the first part of my cute little phrase here. Secondly, Jesus heals to reveal. There is a purpose to Jesus' healing here, and it is to display, to show, to reveal. As Jesus says, this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Jesus didn't just come to heal people. He came to heal people so that they and everyone around them would see God. He came to display, to reveal God's power and love. Now, we walk by faith. We shouldn't have to see a display of miracles to believe. Jesus actually has some pretty harsh words for people who insist on seeing it before believing. But at the same time, God is awesome and God is powerful and he likes to show off every now and then. That's one of the reasons Jesus came performing miracles, because he wanted to show people that the kingdom of God was present and that had entered the world in a powerful way. That's what he tells the disciples when he sends them out doing miracles. The kingdom of God, God is near. Go show it. Go heal diseases. Drive out demons. Reveal it to people. Show it to them. God has always wanted to display his power for people. Way back in the book of Exodus, for example, God was leading his people out of Egypt. He wanted to make a lasting impression on them. So he performed miracle after miracle. He parted the Red Sea. He turned the Nile to blood. He brought plagues and diseases. Some of the miracles weren't all that pleasant. Here's what he tells Moses and the Israelites way back then. He says, I'm going to make a covenant with you. Before all your people, I will do wonders never before done in any nation of the world. The people you live among will see how awesome is the work that I, the Lord, will do for you. That was God's promise to the Israelites. The people around you will see the awesome things that I can do. Now, just so you know, I'm actually a little bit uncomfortable with that. It seems kind of showy. It seems like, sounds like my kids in the backyard... Whenever they're goofing off in the backyard, they want me to show how they want to show me how awesome they are. Look, Dad, I can dribble with both hands. Look, Dad, I can bounce on the fence. Look, Dad, we can put Miranda in the plastic car and roll her down the hill like a crash test dummy. She'll be okay. That's amazing. That's awesome. Thanks for showing. Kids can be kind of showy, but God can be too. Then again, He is God. If He wants to show off, I'm okay with that. Besides which, there's always a reason he shows off. There's always a reason he displays his glory. He displays his glory for his people. That's what he tells Moses. The people will see how awesome is the work that I, the Lord, will do for you. And even here in John, God doesn't show off for the heck of it, but to reveal himself to this man so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. This is primarily how God likes to show off. He likes to show off in the lives of his people. And that's what happened in, in this story. When this formerly blind man showed up back home, the people couldn't figure him out. They said, you look like our blind beggar friend, but we know you're not him because you can see you look like him, but you're different. He told them, I am the man I can see now. That's how God reveals himself to the world, by displaying his power in our lives so that our friends can't figure us out. You're like you used to be, but you're also kind of different. You're full of love and grace and courage, not like you used to be. Is that even really you? It's my prayer for Matt, actually, Matt Henderson, and for Matt Herndon, our new baptizee this morning. My prayer is that God would display his power in him by changing who he is, by filling him with grace and love and patience and hope and self-control so that when Matt shows up to work, his friends say, hey, you're like Matt, but not Matt. Are, are you even Matt? Because... You know, you used to look like that blind beggar guy, but now you're like, a diff you kind of look like him, but you're kind of different. And all he has to say is, God is displaying his power in me for you to see. That's how God reveals his power for the world in our lives, by making us different. Do your family and friends notice something different about you? Are they confused by who you are? You, you, you're like different. You're the same, but different. You used to be this, but now you're this. What's going on? 
Jesus heals to reveal the power and the glory of God. And finally, Jesus heals to reveal he is real. Jesus heals to reveal is real. Again, Jesus did not just perform this miracle so that the man could see or even so God could show off. He performed this miracle so that the man would come to believe in him, that Jesus is the real deal. And here we got to look forward in the story a little bit. We can see over the course of this story, which goes on for many more verses, that this man's understanding of Jesus begins to slowly change. When Jesus first heals the man, he has no idea who did this to him. His friends ask him, how then were your eyes open? And he responds, this man, they call him Jesus. He made some mud. Blind man didn't know who Jesus was. He was just a man called Jesus who made some mud. As we'll see next week, the Pharisees actually, Jesus' opponents, drag him in for a deposition and they ask him, well, who do you think this Jesus is? And the man says, I don't know, a prophet. So now he's not just a man, but what is he? He's a prophet. Even later in the story, Jesus catches up with a man born blind. He asks him, well, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Jesus said, well, you have now seen him. In fact, he's the one speaking to you. And the man said, Lord, I believe. So he's gone from being a man named Jesus to a, to a prophet, now to the, he's the Lord. This was the purpose of the miracle all along. Jesus performed this miracle not just so the man could see the world or see the trees or see the stars or see this or that. He made this guy so that the man could see him. Jesus even tells him this. Jesus asks the man if he believes in the Son of Man, and the man asks Jesus who the Son of Man is, and Jesus says, you have now seen him. You are looking at him. I gave you sight so that we could see each other. It reminds me of another miracle. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 2. Some people bring a paralyzed man to Jesus. Jesus is impressed by their faith, and he looks at the man, and he says, your sins are forgiven. People are actually upset that Jesus is so presumptuous as to think he can forgive this man's sins. As they remind him, only God can forgive sins. So Jesus looks at him, and he says, well, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. In other words, I'm going to heal this man, but not just so he can walk. I'm going to heal this man so that you know I'm the real deal. This is important because belief in Jesus is the ultimate medicine. It provides the ultimate healing. Anything else is temporary. All these healings that we read about in the New Testament, they last a few years until they wear off in death. Take this man born blind that Jesus healed. Do you know where he is right now? He is blind, dead, and buried. Who knows how he died? Maybe a few years after he was healed, he had his eyes pecked out by a vicious flock of ravens. It was a terrible way to go. And that paralyzed man that Jesus made walk in Mark 2, he eventually expired as well. Who knows how? Maybe he was on his way home from being healed of his paralysis, feeling on top of the world. He wasn't paying attention as he was driving home through the intersection, never saw the other camel coming. Or the lame man that Jesus healed in John 6, you know, the one by the pool called Bethesda. Jesus made him walk. He's dead now too. According to the news reports, he got home that night, slipped on a bar of soap in the shower. All these healed people died. That doesn't mean these miracles were pointless. They saw God's glory revealed to them. They came to believe in his power. That doesn't mean we should pray desperately for miracles and healings. We want to see God's glory. We need to see his glory. But the point of God's healing work isn't to make us walk or see or live healthy lives. The point of God's healing work in our lives is so that we might believe he is real. It's by belief in Jesus that we will live forever by belief in Jesus that we will walk and see and hear forever in heaven. So maybe you need healing this morning, healing in your body, your heart, your mind, your family. Pray that Jesus heals you. Ask others to pray for you. Jesus can and does heal. He heals to reveal he is real. He proved he was real by opening the eyes of this blind man so all could see. He wants to open ours too so that he can show us God's glory. We thank God that he has, and we pray that he does. Let's pray.